Now, let's go talk to uh, Mary Wilson. She's got a wonderful story that I want you guys to hear about. Mary, welcome to the uh, Young Turks Network and Rebel Headquarters in particular. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm very, very happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you, sister. So, uh, so here's a fun story. Uh, you're running in Texas 21st District. Uh, Texas has a system where there's runoffs if no one gets 50%. Uh, Mary, you got no chance. Uh, there's a guy in the race, Joseph Kopser, who's raised nearly $800,000. How much did you raise, Mary? Well, I had $40,000. Uh, 30,000 of that was my own money. Okay, all right, uh, so yeah. <laughs> I, I can do the math. Uh, you were outraised 20 to one. Uh, and yes. and then there was Derek Crow, who's a really good guy, who's a, a deeply progressive. Yes. He was a Justice Democrat, and so it was a fascinating race. Um, and all right, of a sudden, right. you whooped them both. <laughs> <laughs> I came in number well, one. Well, let me let me start. Yeah, let me just start off by saying, uh, over the course of the year of campaigning, Derek and I got to be friends. It wasn't just that we were running. There, there became a true admiration, mutual admiration, and I think genuine affection for one another. And uh, I absolutely adore Derek and appreciate everything he's done and the messages that he was getting out on the campaign as well. And how he immediately turned around the night of the election and the next morning to tell people uh, to get behind me, that the progressive values had won and that I was the candidate to support. You know, the Democratic establishment often talks about unity, but it's fake unity. They just want you to do whatever they tell you to do. Yeah. This is real unity. So yeah, yeah. When, when you have two Absolutely. decent people involved in a democracy and, and you guys run and, and you wind up winning Mary, bless your heart for that. And, and then Derek turns around and immediately asks all of his volunteers and staffers to come to your side. Is that right? That was that's exactly right. And one of the first things that I did actually was hire his field director to be my new campaign manager, because I recognized that Derek had the best field game out of the entire campaign. So I, I hope I showed a little um, insight or, and even respect to say, you know, you what you did this well, and uh, I, I, I'm going to bring that part to this next phase. To the campaign and, and bring some of those people together as part of my team and my staff. So, Mary, um, are you now a just Democrat? Yes, I am. That's awesome. Yes, I am. That's, that's uh, great. And yes. so, uh, look, I think that speaks well both of the organization for realizing she's a wonderful candidate. Uh, so, let's unify in all the great yes. ways, the right ways. And I think it speaks really well of you that they had a candidate running against you, and now you've joined up nonetheless and getting their support. So it's just, it's a wonderful story. But I think the most interesting part of the story is how you did it. And that part I don't know, okay? And so again, let me right. set, yeah, so let me set the context for everybody. So sure. it, you had more people in the race than just you three, but you three were the top vote getters. But the top two advanced the runoff. Now you didn't get 50%, so you're in the runoff. You're in the runoff with the guy with all the money, right? And so right. we're going to find right. out, uh, you know, who, who's going to win that primary when the runoff happens. So, but now you know you got Derek's crew behind you. You got the Just Democrats behind you, and and so that's how this the rest of this race is going to unfold. And, and nothing is for certain yet. And I want to save the conversation about. Mm -hmm. The, the guy with the money uh, to the end. But now, tell me okay. with that little resources, without almost any of the media covering you, without any infrastructure, how did you come in number one in the initial vote? Yeah, that's a really interesting. And I'll, I'll admit, you know, coming in first was uh, a little bit unexpected to be fair and to be honest. But throughout the district, I had people telling me, Mary, you've got a lot of support out here. You're going to make this runoff. Now, I didn't have any way to quantify that exactly because what, it, what does that mean when people just tell you in passing that you're doing well? Um, you hope that that's true, but you can't you know, put numbers to it. So the reason I think that I did as well as I did 
are a couple of things. I think people are looking for different types of candidates. And for instance, the races in Virginia, you know, we're just, you know, your real estate agent or I don't know, other teachers uh, around the country have, have come out and said, I want to run for office. And my background is in education and now as a minister. And I uh, looked around and thought, you know, I've done a lot of things that I'm very proud of in my life. And I've been an activist and I've marched and I've protested, I've lobbied and testified, all those kinds of things. And I kept thinking, there's got to be more. What else can I do? And so I decided to run for office. And I think this we are in an era now where we want people who are working class type people, people who are your basic caring type of people to be in politics. And I think we want people in elected offices that uh, that show that they care about the population and not just about the money. Uh, yeah. Making money is, man, it's... it's it's like the god of our country in so many ways and and in politics for sure and i've never realized how much so until i became a candidate yeah so i definitely get that part 16 years as a pastor uh 20 years yeah. as a mathematics math teacher and and, and professor right and mm -hmm. and people are uh excited by real human beings running for office to represent us yeah. Yeah. and that's the way it should have been all along until the money corrupted everything uh, right. But but let's talk about the mechanics just a little bit more. Um, sure. So how did you get volunteers? How many volunteers did you get? What did you have them do? What did you do with the 40,000 that you had? Right, right. So uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, volunteers in, in the dozens and I had them target uh, particular precincts in Austin, San Antonio for um, flyers, door hangers, and, and door knocking, that sort of thing that's kind of standard fare. Um, I I spent uh, an, in, a, an interesting amount of money in San Antonio on signage and uh, flooded the district in San Antonio with name recognition because a couple of the candidates in our race did some polls at the end of the year, at the end of December, 1st of January. And those polls indicated at the very least that we needed name recognition. And San Antonio, like Austin, is a big city and there's a lot of precincts and a lot of different neighborhoods. It's like, how do you get name recognition when there's so much space to cover? And so I spent basically $10,000 to put up nearly 500 signs in San Antonio in order to get name recognition. And then I followed that up by the, some of the door knocking and meeting people in, uh, you know, local establishments and introducing myself. And then when I would hear, ah, I saw your sign. Oh yes, you're Mary. Then I knew that that was working to an extent. Hmm. Uh, I did not. I did not win Barrett County, where San Antonio is. I did come in second there, but it. I think it demonstrated that that particular tactic in that particular area was very helpful. Um, in Austin, where all four candidates live, I already had some name recognition from my activism and lobbying work that I had done. So I just tried to continue to capitalize on that in the corners where people knew me and made sure that they knew I was running for office and what my positions were that I think they were already familiar with from, from having known me. Uh, and then in the Hill Country, I just made sure I went to every possible event. I've been to uh, San Marcos, well, San Marcos is just down the highway, but I went to the San Marcos Pride Parade, and I happened to be the only candidate in the race that went to the San Marcos Pride Parade. And of course, I went to the Austin Pride Parade. I've even been to the Kerrville Rotary Club and to any place where I thought I could talk to people. Um, now, having said that, I think the other candidates <clears throat> did that as much as they possibly could as well. But that is where I focus my efforts, knowing that with a limited amount of money and limited resources because of that, I had to show up at every possible place. And I also recognize that there is nothing better for potential voters than to actually talk to 
the candidate, uh, in this case herself. And so I just tried to make myself as available and accessible as I possibly could. And, and so if you'll excuse me, just two more sure. questions about the mechanics and then uh, yeah. and then I wanna get to your positions too uh, in the limited time that we have. But uh, so when you say signs, uh, do you mean house signs, like the, the, the lawn signs? And uh, some, some, uh, I mean like four by eight and four by four signs uh, spread out through uh, highways and roads and neighborhoods throughout the district where uh, if somebody left their home to go to the grocery store, they saw one of my signs so that they knew my name. Okay, and and so, and then uh, did you do any ads? So I imagine with that budget, you couldn't do TV, but did you do digital no. ads? Uh, very, very limited, but I did do some Facebook boost, uh, but not any beyond that. Uh, fortunately, we are we do have more money already than what I did, and we've already been doing some digital ads. Uh, in fact, my spouse came up to me the other day and showed me where she'd been playing a game on uh, on her phone. Uh, I don't know, uh, solitaire or something, and and one of my digital ads came up. So uh, that was very exciting to see that. Okay, we've at, now been able to add that to our arsenal of of getting my name out there and, and advertising our campaign. Yeah, well, uh, I wanna help uh, in that regard. So uh, I love the link that you guys uh, have now, justicedemocrats.com slash mighty Mary uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> to donate to Mary. Yeah, yeah. and so elect Mary, yeah. Yeah, electmarywilson.com is the website. Uh, and uh, and electmarywilson.com slash volunteer, of course. Uh, volunteers yeah. make a huge difference and then justdemocrats.com slash. Mighty Mary. I mean, volunteers are what make it happen, and, and uh, I'm I'm very glad that I am able to pay some staff members now in ways that I couldn't prior to the primary. But you know, none of this works without volunteers. They they are the lifeblood of any campaign. Yep, and so those links are of course uh, down below in the description box on YouTube and uh, and in the comment section on Facebook. Easy to click. Just go check it out. Uh, and participate in any way you can. So uh, now, real quick, back to uh, uh, Mr. Moneybags. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what what is his governing philosophy? What's his thesis for why mm -hmm. he could win in what now is a Republican district? Lamar Smith is retiring, but it's only R plus ten, which now in Pennsylvania we just had one flip when it was R plus well, nineteen, right? right? So, yeah, yeah. and what is your philosophy uh, compared to his? Well, I think honestly, it has a lot to do with money. It seems like his main argument for winning in November is that he has more money and therefore will be able to win the election. Uh, the The problem with that in Texas, in particular, is Republicans always outraise Democrats. Uh, Beto may be uh, showing some signs of changing that with his very grassroots campaigning and fundraising. But the history has been that Democrats are outraised by Republicans seven to one or nine to one. And my argument then is, well, we need a candidate that can, that can prove and has proven that she can win while being outspent. And, uh, and that has a message that gets voters out to the polls. Because we've been looking at some of the precinct uh, turnout in areas where I did well. And, and there is, uh, I think, an argument to be made that, that my messaging brought some new voters to the polls. And that we're in a different time now where establishment money is not going to be what wins an election. That we need a, a message and a progressive message of one that shows that we care about people's health care, uh, the you know, the Medicare for all platform, where we care about how how people are able to send their children to school and not just our public schools K through twelve, but what are we doing with college and college debt and how in the world can you know, graduates become part of our economic system, for lack of a better phrase, if they are saddled with this enormous debt now that's coming out of colleges. So I think we're ready for a different message, a different type of candidate. I think we're ready for somebody, you know, like myself who has sent two kids to college. I, I have a couple of grandsons. I have a future that I envision for them of a, you know, a viable, healthy planet and, and, uh, 
I just think people are ready for that kind of message. And I think that that is really what is turning out voters. And I think the establishment has missed it yeah. in this election. I, I they, t- they've just missed the messaging. Yeah, I, I totally agree because it's not in their heart, it's not in their DNA. Uh, whereas yeah. you've been doing it for decades and I, and I right. saw you went to right. Standing Rock, you've been with Black Lives Matter yes. activists and you lived it. You don't, it's, that's the problem with a lot of politicians, they gotta fake it, right? You don't have to fake well, it, right. you lived I mean, it. I, right, I don't have to explain, like, I don't, I've done the work, my internal work to understand where my privilege exists and when I have it and uh, and where other people don't. And I'm not sure that that the establishment Democrats for all the you know hope that we have that they're for the working class and for the people in in our culture that often find themselves on the outside. I'm not sure that they've really done the work to understand what that means and to actually live it. And you know, being a, a part of the LGBTQ community, that's something that I personally had to do. And then by doing that in my own life, it helped me understand how to do that in response to other stories and other people's stories. Um, I was at uh, an event recently where I was sitting next to a college student, a young African American student, and I said, you know what, at my age, my story and what, what my truth is, is going to be different than what your story and your truth is. And that's why it's so incredibly important to be able to listen to each other. And for me, when I'm in a position of privilege, to set aside that privilege to recognize what someone else's life story is like and to hear it and to hear it uh, in, with intention. Yes, mighty Mary Wilson. Uh, I it, it would be a, <laughs> I love the sound of that. I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've earned it, sister. You've earned Thank it. You. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I can't wait for the for the primary night when we find out if if you pull that off. Then I can't yeah. wait for the general election night. And if I get to call you uh, mighty Congressman Mary Wilson, uh, uh, I would love that because it would it would show that we really have taken steps to change the way money functions in our country and the way money functions in politics. And and money cannot be what drives our political process. It has to be the message, it has to be the experience that people bring to it. And it has to be a, the ability to care about one another in real and significant ways. Yep, so if you're in the 21st district of Texas, let Mary represent you. Thank you very much. <laughs>